Second week, including our series on, 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 on freedom, discovering the divine you. And today we're talking about generational blessings, how to pass on blessings to the next generation. Because my Bible says there's blessings and there's curses. Like, oh, what is all this weird stuff? I'll explain it to you. Uh, and basically, a blessing is when God's in your life. When God's in your life and the favor of God is on you, that's blessing. When God's protection and favor and presence is not, is not upon us, that's a curse. It's real simple. And, and when you're under, no longer under God's umbrella, that's a problem. The enemy has free reign. And so blessing is what we want to see happen. And so today we're talking about generational blessing and curses. And so I want to mention it to you. Now, that's what it's really about. And so what we want to be able to do is, is to help the next generation to be freer than we are today, to help, to, to, to bless them and send them on the way that God would have them, have us to have them go. And so I want to talk to you in a few moments about that. I want to go ahead and start off right off the bat reading the scripture because the Bible talks about generational blessings and curses. This is found as you read the Ten Commandments. In the middle of the Ten Commandments, there is a description of what generation blessings and curses are. What we're going to do is we're going to define it here for a few moments. I'm going to talk to you what how blessings started, and how we can pass them on to our own family and how to break stuff, okay? That's today. So let's go ahead and get into our scripture, first scripture today, Exodus 20, verses 3 through 6. This is the, the God speaking through the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or it's in the earth beneath or it's under the water or under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Let me stop here for a moment. You're saying, well, I don't have any idols in my house. Well, there used to be a program on, on television called the American Idol. We do have idols. Idols are things that we put beyond God. In those days, they had little idols on their, on their mantles. And I've been to countries like India where I've actually seen idols. And so they have idols, and they would represent their gods. And no other idols before you. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting on the iniquity of the fathers and upon the children to the third and fourth generations for those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Well, hold on a second. God is a jealous God? I thought jealousy is a bad thing. Well, the word jealous in the Hebrew means passionate. God is passionate about his relationship with us to such a degree he does not want to see us get hurt. He loves us, and he's jealous for us. Okay, that's a good jealousy. God's passionate about his relationship with you and I so much that he gets very... Listen, I'm passionate about my children. I'm passionate about what God has placed in my care. And I'm very important to them that they do a good job and they live a good life. And if something comes again, you better believe I'm jealous for them doing God's will. In a good way, okay? That's what it is. And the Bible says here, this is what I like so much. It says, listen to this. For I'm the Lord, jealous God, visiting the iniquity. Iniquity is something that you continually do. Iniquity of the fathers upon the third and fourth generations. That sometimes that if you do something, listen, it doesn't sound very fair, but let me give you an example. If I'm driving a minivan, which I happen to drive, and I drive irresponsible, my family is in the minivan. And I'm driving, I'm eating a hamburger and whatever. I'm doing, I'm not, my hands are not on the wheel. I'm speeding. And I get in a car accident. The kids might get hurt. Is that fair? No. But what happens? I'm driving it, and I'm responsible, and there's consequences for my leadership in that van. And make no mistake, there are consequences for your actions upon the next generation, whether good or bad. And so it doesn't sound fair, but it's the way it is. So I'm a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the third or fourth generation. But listen to this. I love this. God's default setting is not curses. It's blessings. But, but, what does it say here? But showing mercy to what? Not three or four generations, but thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. In other words, God is not some angry God waiting to beat somebody across the head. He wants to bless us, not curse us, 
But if we don't behave properly and we open the door to the enemy, there can be curses of the three or four generations. Why is it there's certain families that, my goodness, the, the, the father drank, the mother drank, the grandfather drank, the great-grandfather drank, and they're, they're drunks too. Why is it this is person so prideful? Have you heard of an Irish temper? Uh, you know, or how about the Germans? I'm German. I keep on telling them. And they make great automobiles. They're engineers. In fact... Uh, I, they've done studies here. This is a growing body of evidence in the, uh, in the study of genetics that they say, according to much research, that our DNA is written by our behavior. In other words, uh, if you like, let's suppose you like basketball, and you do it as a young child. You do it all the time. You love basketball. Well, that actually gets written to your DNA. So when you have kids, chances are they might like basketball too. Now, my great-grandfather was uh, born in Germany in 1860-something. Can you believe it? And he played the violin. He was a musician. Well, my dad was also a musician. And so that came upon me, and I play guitar. And then apparently it's upon my son and my kids. They also are music musically inclined. Now, as far as being a handyman, my grandfather was an engineer. He made things. I, I didn't get that at all. <laughs> I am just pathetic with a hammer. But my, my grandfather was an amazing engineer. He would make things. They were factory owners in Germany. And so, and, and then my other, my, my grandparents decided they served the Lord. And my grandparents served the Lord. My parents served the Lord. Now I'm serving the Lord. My dad's a pastor. I'm a second generation pastor. There's something about generational blessings and cursings. Now, my father came from a dysfunctional household, but he drew a line in the sand. He says, I am going to serve God, and he broke the generational curse of poverty and of all kinds of abuse, and he went forward. Out of alcoholism, out of all kinds of nonsense, my father broke forward. And my mother, amen, thank you. All two of you out there. And so he drew a line in the sand saying, no more, I'm going forward. And so this is the good news. You and I can cut off the past and bring the new of God's blessing. I'm going to show you in a few moments how you can do such because it's really true. The Bible says you should know the truth and the truth will cut you free. And so this is what happens. A lot of us live in poverty. If we don't know who you are in Christ, you can live in poverty. I heard of a story of a man that was uh, on the street pushing a shopping cart. He had over $650,000 in the bank plus real estate, and he died, and they didn't realize this man had a fortune, but he didn't utilize it. Many of us don't recognize that God has given us an inheritance through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the promises of God, that we can pass generations onto our children and our children's children. Have you ever heard, uh, there's a guy by the name of Jonathan Edwards, he was a revivalist in the 1700s. In fact, he used to go down Whitney Avenue and, and literally went down Route 10 and did revivals in some of the churches that are no longer here anymore. And there was a great awakening in New England prior. Uh, and, and amazing wells were dug in the past of revival right here in New England. And we're believing God for it to happen again. But he was a man of great, great, great stature. And he was a man that served God. And he raised his kids. And I actually met his great, 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 great grandson, whose name happens to be Jonathan Edwards. And he's a philanthropist. And he helps ministries. And, and his godly line went on. And I, did a, I read a study about it um, by uh, the turn of the, of the last century. An American educator, Pastor A.E. Wins, Winship, decided to trace the descendants of Jonathan Edwards almost 150 years after his death. His findings are astounding. I'm reading here, especially when compared to a man by the name of Max Jukes. Sounds like a boxer. Max Jukes. Okay, Max Jukes. Jukes' legacy came to the forefront when the family tree of 42 different men in the New York prison system traced back to him. So Max Jukes was a, was a thief. He was a man that was lawless, and his, his, his uh, lineage followed in that. Jonathan Edwards, who was a revivalist, who wrote the sermon, hands... Uh, hands of, uh, wait, hands of a, I can't remember what it's called. I know some of you are going to say it. Hands of, uh, singers in the hands of an angry God. I got it right. Sins in the hands of an angry God. And that sermon sparked a revival here in New England. What kind of sermon is that? That's for another time. But Jonathan Edwards, God legacy includes one U.S. vice president, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 professors, 80 public office holders, 100 lawyers, and to balance it off, 100 missionaries. I'm just having fun. Max Jukes' descendants included seven, Max Jukes, 
seven murderers, 60 thieves, 50 women of debauchery, in other words, they're prostitutes, 130 other convicts, 310 paupers, with over 2,000, 300 years lived in the poorhouse, if you combine them all together. 400 of them were physically wrecked by indulgent living, and it was estimated that Max Duke's descendants cost the state of New York more than $6.5 million. So there you have an example of a godly legacy to Jonathan Edwards and Max Jukes. Don't name your child Max Jukes. But there is something to be said about generation blessings and generation cursings. I don't know about you, but I want to, I want to have blessings follow me. In fact, it's my design and hope that my children would supersede me in every capacity possible. It always befuddles me, and I, I scratch my head in bewilderment when I, I hear a parent jealous of her kids. How does that happen? I, I don't get that. But I, as far as my wife and I are concerned, we want to see our kids be better and stronger and greater than we ever, ever had them. But there's something I want to bring to your attention here. There's something that, that we can do. We can break past. If you have a past that's really bad, you have a past where your mother and father were in poverty, or you have a past where they're involved with drug addiction, or maybe there's been like divorce in your family from generation to generation to generation. Maybe there's been issues with pride, issues with sickness. My, my grandfather died of a heart attack when he was 45. My father died of a heart attack when he was 45, and I'm 44 and a half. I guess I'm going to die. No, you don't have to live under that kind of thing. Because there's several things that affect you and what you have. There is physical DNA. Obviously, there's some things in your family line, such as health issues, but there's also behavior DNA that the way you act does make a difference. The Bible said it for a long time about your iniquity will be on your kids, how you live. So how you live. So if you're living godly as a young man or a young woman, you have kids, chances are some of that stuff you did as a kid, young people, listen to me. If you think you can just go crazy until you're 25 and get it right, I had news for you. Plant the seeds of righteousness when you're young. Because that baggage could be passed on to your kids. We'll talk about how to break it off a little bit later. And so your behavior does that. And there is spiritual DNA. The enemy is not dumb. He knows how to do it. He says, okay, the grandfather had a trouble with, uh, with drinking. Therefore, uh, let's deal with this guy, Jack, who's the third generation. Let's kind of tempt him in the area of drinking. Because he's weak, and that's in his family lineage. So we can mess with that. And that's what the enemy will do. I mean, face it, I know people that breed dogs. It's a different dogs have different characteristics, with different families have different characteristics as well, through genetics. So there's physical genetics, there's behavioral genetics, and there's spiritual genetics. Make no mistake about it. It all works. And so you can break it by the power and the blood of Christ, which I'm going to show you in a few moments. So... I want to take you back to something I preached a while ago. Uh, it's one of the things I pray nearly every single day. Would you please go to your Bibles to Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. We're going to look at this, look at the, look the significance of these verses and how it applies to us today. And I believe this is the launch pad, pun intended, to help us to break the generational curses and pronounce blessings upon our families and our family families. All right. In Genesis 12... Um, Abram, at the time, was living in the area of Iraq and Iran. He was, and apparently, a lot of paganism was, paganism was going on then. Uh, some studies reveal from archaeology that some of them, they worship the Baal. They worship the calf. They actually worship the, like a, a bull god. Isn't it interesting, later on through Israel's history, when they walked away from God, what do they do? They worship what? The calf. So that came all the way from, our, from, all the way from his, his, his ancestry. But what could happen here? Uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house. Let me say something very clear. This is really encouraging to me. God wants us to get out of our country. Not because of the elections that are going on right now. <laughs> but he wants us to get out of our country. What does he mean by that is that our association with our country, I am first a citizen of heaven, second a citizen of the United States of America. And if our country goes off the deep end, I'm not going to follow it. I'm going to follow God. Consequences come where they will. And so he's telling to Abram, get out of your country. You have to be willing to get out of our culture. Our culture is very materialistic. Our culture is very self-centered. Are you willing to get out of it? Get out of it. And it says, from your family. Are you willing to leave your family behind? 
Jesus said, he who doesn't hate his mother and father is not worthy of me. It doesn't mean that we hate our mother and father. He says, compared to me. That Jesus has to be the number one priority in our life above our family. And I know people in this church that have decided to serve God despite their country and despite their family. The Gamahadis. I think they're back there. And they're going to become American citizens next week? Come on. Gamahadis are from Iran. Muslim background. I'm going to serve Jesus. He had, he's willing to leave his family behind. Leave his country behind and serve God. It's easy for us to say that here in, a, in an air-conditioned uh, sanctuary. But let me tell you something now. These people suffered for their faith. And we're honored to have you here in our church. We really are. Get out of your country and from your family and from your father's house. Some people just, you know, it's like the godfather. No, you got to be willing to break away from your family if they're not serving God. To a land that I will show you. Now, that's, yeah, that's scary. When you leave your family behind, you leave your country behind, you leave the way, old way of doing things, and God, oh, God, what are you going to do? I'll show you what it is. Tell me what's going to happen. No, I'm going to show you along the way. God won't often give you the full picture. He says, you go one step ahead, and I'll give you a light. And that's a walk of faith. Now, this is something I pray over my children, and I pray myself nearly every day. He says, I will, listen to this. Here's the promise of Abraham. I will make you a great nation. And the Hebrew word for nation, and even the Greek Septuagint um, translates it as ethne, which means people group. I will make you a great people group, and it also means nation. God wants to make you and I a great nation, that the Bucci family will continue on as a great uh, group of people, a great nation. God wants to make you a great nation. I will make you a great nation, okay? I will bless you and make your name great. God wants to bless you and make your name great. Now, this is the Jewish people. I have a Jewish doctor. Great guy. I mean, we, we try to leave him behind. We can't. We keep going back to him. We went to drive all the way to New Haven for this guy. Oh, amazing guy. I just had my <laughs> physical. <clears throat> After 40, you don't like what happens. But anyhow, let's move on. And I was talking to my doctor. And I said, hey, doc, you know, I know you're Jewish, and I just want to say it's an honor. I said, I can see you're really blessed. Do you ever bless your kids? I was talking about blessing your kids. He says, you know, I didn't do as much as I wanted to, but when I was a ch child. My father used to lay hands on me and call me blessed. Have you noticed that the Jewish culture, some of the greatest scientists, greatest entertainers, politicians, bankers, you name it, are Jewish? The contribution of the Jewish people is extraordinary. And I said to the gentleman, I said, you know, you come from a godly heritage. I said, your genetics... Because they walk, they, they've been through so much, they persevered, they worked together, and God's blessings upon your life, and that's why you're a blessing. He said to me, I said, I get tears in my eyes when I hear that because uh, he says, I love when it says, I will bless you so you can be a blessing to the world. And he understood that. And I said, you know, and, and Jesus is the most, I told him about Jesus as well. You know, but great doctor, love the guy. Uh, not, not enough to go back for an appointment, but when I have to go, at least he's a nice guy. But, um, and so, you know, we talked about that Jewish people, they are blessed. Why is it they, they, they're financially successful, right? Think about it. People get jealous of the Jewish people because they're successful. They're, they got God's blessing on them. They have genetic blessing. They have behavioral blessing. And yes, God's hand of blessing is upon the Jewish people. Make no mistake about it. And to me, it's, it's actually supernatural that anti-Semitic is rising in our culture today. It makes no sense to hate Jewish people, but there's a demonic stronghold that hates God's firstborn of salvation, and would do all he can do to hurt that. And any, any political candidate that does not stand up for Israel, good luck to our country if we ever leave Israel in the dust. I'm going to tell you that. You don't like it, I'm sorry. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse you. Well, I guess we don't have many people that like Israel here. Can I hear better than that? All right. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. Listen to this here. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. 
and you shall be a blessing. God blesses us so we can be a blessing to other people. It's not so we can be rich and drive around in a shiny car with a shiny ring and a shiny house. Look at me. My kids are going here. No, it's God blesses us so we can bless others. That's what it's all about, to make the world a better place for Christ Jesus. Verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. Whoa, I don't like that. It's negative. Well, you know what? I've grown up, and I've seen what God has done for us as a family. Now, I, I, please don't. I'm not saying this pridefully. I'm saying this as a matter of fact. I get a little anxious when I see what has happened to people that have come against our family growing up. My dad's standing in righteousness, and he said, oh, Lord, he said well, we're going to hand them over to the Lord. I'm, I'm, Lord, we give them to you. You deal with it. <laughs> Let me tell you what things have happened. It's, it's, it's alarming. It's scary. And so, I, seriously, God will take care of you. You give it to God, God will take care of it. And we pray, and I don't want to harm anybody, but let me just say something. I've seen God curse those that have cursed us. Pastor, how can you say that? I just said it. <laughs> it's very simple. And I know it's a bit sobering. And I don't, believe me, I don't go around with a witch's broth. Yeah, I'm going to put a curse on. No, it's not about that. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that, Okay. You like that. Don't, now you like it, huh? Forget about Israel. You like it. Okay. It's not about that. But God protects us. He does. And so God is, you know, God, I give it to you, Lord. You do, I'm going to let it all, I'm, instead of carrying it in your gut, God, I hand it to you. And God is taking care of you. God will take care of you. This is the issue. If you don't understand who you are, then you can't have the inheritance that's yours. If you don't know how much money is in the bank, then you can't write checks. Right? Those checks of blessing that God has given us. Now, we'll continue to continue on. And you shall be able, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I put my hands on my children's head and I pray this scripture over them nearly every single day. I do. The jury's still out on our children, but I'm believing they're going to serve God like, my, like, like I've served God, my dad served God. And say, God, make their name great, that they be a blessing to other people. When God gives you money, it's not so you can spend it on yourself. It's not so you can give it to the government either. It's so you can help other people. Well, the government does a good job. Let me just stop. Let me get out of politics. I'm not going to go there today. I did in the first service. I will not do it in the second one. Okay. Let me show you something else about Abraham. Abraham's sin passed on to his, his generation. Let me give you some examples of how you have generational blessings and generational curses. All in four minutes and 36 seconds. Okay. Abraham lied about his wife, Sarah. He said, oh, this is my sister. He's kind of a, you know, he kind of twisted it. And it was, un, it was untrue. He told Pharaoh that. And then he told Abimelech the same thing later on. He lied twice about his wife not being, be, being his, uh, his wife. He said it was his sister. And he had a child named Isaac. And guess what Isaac did? Isaac did the same thing. He lied about his wife saying it's my sister. You see it in the scripture. You can see later on in David, King David. You know what happened to King David? King David uh, basically slept with another man's wife, Uriah, the Hittite, slept with Bathsheba, okay, get her pregnant, end up killing him, and, and that's what happened. You know what the Bible said? The sword will not leave your family. And his kids had to suffer because of, his, because of what he did. However, God forgave him, and God blessed David despite his sin, and as a result of God's, God's um, healing of him, his family line became the line of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Do you see that? An amazing thing. And, and it'll show you something else I'm going to show you here. Your behavior, what you do today affects tomorrow. It's like a chain. And so when you decide not to be selfish, you're helping your kids not to want to be selfish. When you decide, I will be sexually pure, you're helping make it easier for your children to be sexually pure. When you decide to be a person that is generous, it helps your kids become more generous. When you decide not to hold bitterness against anybody, it makes it easy for your kids not to do it because you are giving them spiritual blessing and behavioral blessing. And so your behavior does matter. But even beyond that, even beyond that, you can bless generations after you because of what you do right here, right now. Let me give you, show you some examples. In 1 Kings 11... 11 through 12, David had Solomon, all right? Now, I want to show you something here. 
Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, who's turning away from God, because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I commanded you, I surely will tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days. Why? For the sake of your father David. In other words, because of David's covenant with God and because David chose to make it right with God despite his sin. Isn't that good news, everybody? We can screw up royally, but God can forgive us. Okay? And have not kept my covenant. I, I have commanded you. I shall surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David. 2 Kings 8, 19. Yet the Lord will not destroy Judah for the sake of his servant David, as he promised him to give him a lamp for his sons forever. You see, David chose blessing, and the blessings followed him even when the next generation messed up. And I, I believe, grandparents, that you have made a chance and statement, I'm standing for God, and your grandkids will get extra grace because of what you've done. I'm telling you. And that's why it's important, teenagers and young people, how you live now will affect your children. So choose well now. People don't even think about kids yet. I'll tell you, you know what? It comes quick. I remember being a teenager like yesterday. And it comes quick. And so we have here later on in King Hezekiah and Isaiah, it talks about 37, 35, where Sennacherib was coming against Israel, king of Assyria. Look what the Bible has to say. He shall not come into this city, nor shoot the arrow there, nor come. Why? For I would defend the city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David. So generational blessings can follow us based upon how you and I respond to God. Can you see that? Now I got some better news for you. I got some great news for you today. Great news that you don't have to live with a curse upon your life. That, let me show you how. Please turn to Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. I love what it says here. Listen, the word of God is powerful, sharpening any two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit. This can change our life. If you take it in and receive it today, you can break generational curses right here this morning. Galatians 3, 13 to 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everything that hangs on a tree. So Christ became a curse to break the curse. Verse 14, that the blessings of Abraham, listen to that, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Yes, Genesis 12, 1 through 4 applies to us. Why? Because the blessings of Abraham are ours in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? Okay? That the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So the same promises given, I will make your name great, that you could be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those that curse you. And by your name, by your line, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's how Cornerstone should see itself. That's how you should see yourself because it's your, it's your commission from God. You are a child of Abraham if you're a Christ Jesus. And look at later on. Galatians 3.26. For you are all sons of God. When he says sons of God, he means sons of God. And sons were able to receive the inheritance. And he's not just talking to men. He's talking to women too. Okay? For you are all sons of God through how? 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 Through faith in Christ Jesus. You know, when I'm telling you this morning, it takes faith. I was just thinking this morning in the shower. <laughs> a lot of thinking in the shower. That's why our water bill is so expensive. Um, no, we don't have a water bill. We have a well. I just lied. Okay. But nevertheless, I was thinking this morning, I was thinking of a lot of people that I've known through the years that have based their relationship on Jesus Christ upon emotion. And they're a wreck today. And I, I don't know why it's not my notes, but I think I need to say to somebody, do not base your relationship with Jesus Christ or God on your emotions. You need to base it on the unshakable, unmovable word of God that I'm going to stand no matter how I feel. I'm going to stand on the word of God because your feelings will come and go. And I've seen a lot of unstable people. And unfortunately, within our tradition of people that believe in the Spirit of God living today, we tend to worship God through our emotions and throw our minds away and throw our will away. We have to worship God with everything, including our emotions. But you have to stand on the Word of God even when it does not make sense. 
You can say, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going towards north. I don't care how bad the storm is. I'm standing on the word of God. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you for the joy set before me. You throw your anchor ahead and you keep going. Don't let your emotions dictate how you live your life. And that's why at Cornerstone Church, as much as we love the spirit of God, we love all that, but we stand primarily, it's got to be on the word. And that's why you need to get in the word. And so that's a little side note. Back to our regularly scheduled program, as I always tell you. So what does the Bible say here? For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you that were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, listen to this, there's neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave or free, there's neither male or female. It does not mean sexless. It means that you're accepted by God the same. Is that clear? Okay. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And listen to this. This is important. And if you are Christ, then you are whose? Abraham's seed and what? Heirs. Heirs what is an heir? An heir has a right to the promises. If, I give, if you're an heir of an estate, you get all the things of the estate. So all the things that are of Abraham are ours in Christ Jesus. All the promises of Abraham are ours in Christ Jesus. You want to know who you are? Read Genesis 12, 1 through 4. That's who you are. Receive it and take it in. Don't allow the curses to be upon your family. Well, I just don't do good in school. Well, poof, that's going to stop now. I said poof. <laughs> I'm not one of those president's candidates that takes a swear from the podium. Okay. I told you I wouldn't talk about politics. You know what Joshua say? As for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. You've got to take a stand. Stop letting people take a stand for you. You take a stand. If you're a mom or dad of a house, hey, we're not going to have that stuff in our house. Okay? We're not going to allow violent video games in our house. We're not going to allow that kind of music that tears down people. And I have to say this. I'm going to say it. I said I wasn't going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm really, 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 really bothered the kind of rhetoric I'm hearing from the political candidates. I got to tell you, I'm not going to get into politics. I told you that. But I got a real problem when I'm watching a, a thing on television. I, I, see a, I see a candidate running for president um, demeaning somebody and cutting them down, not for their policy, but who they are. Man, I got a problem with that. Oh, I heard, you know, in the past I would laugh, but you realize that every single person is made in the image of God. How dare you speak bad about another human being like that? That's not of God. I'm sorry. Listen, I understand. We look at the candidates. We look what they believe. We see what lines are closer with God. But I'm sorry. I don't care who you are, Democrat, Republican, or no Republican, or no Democrat, independent. No one has the right to be bullying people and calling them jerks and weak. That's not right. It's not of God. And so, you know, I may agree with what they're saying or may not disagree. It's not right to knock someone down and make fun of them. I don't like the comedians on television and they make fun of people. It's not God's will for us to beat each other up with our words. It's not right. You can say what they're doing is wrong. You can say their policies are wrong. You can say that it will lead us into, off the cliff, economic cliff, the moral cliff. That's fine. But don't be telling someone you're a loser. I'm sorry. That's not right. And I was watching that debate the other night and I was really, oh, I felt like, Oh, how could he say that about that person is made in the image of God? How dare you speak that way about somebody? I'm sorry. I'm not going to get political. I told you that already. <laughs> and I didn't get political. It's all about how you speak to each other. Our country is scary, what's going on with our country. I got to tell you. It's scary what's going on. There's a lack of respect. You know the Bible, I'm going to go off again. The Bible says in the book of Jude, it says, Michael, the archangel, when disputing over the body of Moses, did not use an accusation against the enemy, but said, be gone in Christ Jesus. These people are without wisdom. They're like animals for the slaughter. They, 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 um, they, they slander celestial beings. Listen, this is what's going on with our country. We have no respect for anything. It's wrong, my friends. We need to show respect. I don't care if you like the president or don't like the president. I don't care who you like or not. We don't have a right and I don't care if the rest of the society does. We don't have a right to cut people down like that. They're made in the image of God. How dare we speak bad about anybody in that way? You can say what they're doing is wrong. Does that make clear? Okay, I'm sorry. I just had to say that. And I'm not running for president. Lord, help us. That's all I have to say. Lord God, help our country. We need God. And guess who the answer that the problem is? Not a politician. Look at your neighbor and say, you're the answer through Christ Jesus. Go ahead. You want to change this country? 
You're the change. I'm the change. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, hum and I will hear from heaven and heal their land. I've been doing this now 18, 19 years now, being a pastor. I've never, ever from the pulpit said what I just said, but I have to. We can't allow that kind of, I don't want that, honor. listen, I'm going to cut myself off from my, I'm not going to participate in our country like that. I cut myself from my, I'm a citizen of heaven. I will not put up with that nonsense. And if I hear people saying junk on the school bus to the kids, you do not speak bad about someone. Everyone's made in the image of God, whether you like them or not. Okay. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. Back to what we're talking about, which has everything we're talking about. It's called, it's called freedom. It's called who you are in Christ. Know who you are in Christ. Every person has an opportunity to be redeemed, redeemed by Jesus Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free. Verse 29, and if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That's what it's all about, folks. And I like what Joshua has to say in Joshua 24, 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, have you noticed it seems evil to our society? How can you do that? That's wrong. The call good, evil, and evil, good. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in those land who you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm drawing a line in the sand. And I'm going to serve God. Come hell, come high water, I'm going to serve God. If it costs me my life, I'm going to serve God. You have to get to that point. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you, look at your name and say, that's you. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Why? Because of what Christ did, your royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. You are children of Abraham, that you may proclaim the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now a people of God, and have not and who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Listen, we are a royal priesthood, we are God's ambassadors. You don't have to live in a curse of yesterday. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth as a witness against you today. I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Let's choose life not a curse. You don't have to live with an alcoholic past. You don't have to live in a poverty spirit. You don't have to live with sexual brokenness. You don't have to live with uh, all kinds of this junk that's in our society. You can put Christ on and be over it. I want to conclude in this. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. This is huge, 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 huge. I'm not going to get political. I told you that already. Verse 17. If anyone is in, in Christ, he is a new creation. And creation in the Greek means a new creation, a metamorphosis. He is a new creation. I love this. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Your father may have been a drunk. Your mother may have been a drunk. But I draw the line in the sand. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. My father may have had a heart attack when he was 40. But I am a new creation. I, I apply the blood of Christ. I apply the promises of God. And I say to you, I'm not going to put up with you. Greater is he that's within me than he that's in the world. Anyone is in Christ. He's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Our job is to help people. Listen, you don't have to live with a curse. You can live with blessing. Do you see that? And what's blessing? It's not material things. 
blessing is having Christ in your life and getting all the junk off your back. And all things are of God who has reconciled us through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ as though God were pleading through us. God's pleading through me this morning to tell you. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Here it is. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, all that baggage of your family, even the baggage of America, materialism, making fun of people, not treating people with respect, that's not of God. You know what you can do? I can just cut that off in Jesus' name. I take a blood transfusion from the blood of Christ. I am a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. We have the righteousness of God. That means the curses of the past can be broken off. Now, let me tell you something. If you, again, I, why are you picking on alcohol? Because it's a real problem in our society today. Okay, it's, it's an obvious one I can talk about and see the, see the problems with it. Okay, or whatever it could be. Drugs, alcohol, um, pride. But if, if, if your father or your grandfather was an alcoholic, do not drink alcohol. Why? I'm not against alcohol. I, Jesus drank. Okay, I get that. But if it was a stronghold in your family, stay away from it. Because the enemy you see, ah, it used to be a problem. So we're going to go back into Don't stay away from it. If sexual immorality was a problem in your family, maybe you grew up in a family where people were not faithful, don't even come a mile close to infidelity. Don't even talk about it. Stay away from it because it's a propensity in your family. You don't want to go back to what God's delivered you from. Is that clear? Stay away from the generational sins that got you. God broke it off of you, but don't treat it with contempt. Ah, I'm a free. I can do what I No, don't mess with the enemy. He's constantly looking for a reason to meddle, and I don't want to give him any reason to do such. I love what it says here. 1 John 1 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful to, and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Listen. I don't know where you are today, but if you want to break stuff off your family line, first of all, you need the blood of Christ to do it. I mean, you can try hard, go to counseling, take medication, uh, go to 12-step programs. Those are all phenomenal. Those are all great. Nothing wrong with them. But the ultimate breaking point is through the blood of Christ. That's how you break the curse of sin. That only happens by giving your life to Jesus Christ. If you haven't done that, there is a place called heaven and there is a place called hell. I wish I could say it wasn't, it is true. God doesn't send anyone to hell. Our default setting is hell. But God has saved us through Jesus Christ that we could be with him forever. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Some of you, which what I'm saying today, some of you just realize that you have never given your life to Christ. Today is the day of salvation. For those watching at home or on your iPad or whatever device you have, if you pray this prayer today, mean it with your heart, today is a new day. Today can be a day of salvation for you. And you can become a new creation in Christ Jesus and break away from the past. If you want to give your life to Christ today, I'm going to pray after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the way, you're the truth, and the life. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose to follow you. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I choose to follow you with your help. I give my life to you today. In Jesus' name, and I break the power of sin in my life. I thank you that I am now a new creation in Christ Jesus. With every head bowed, say, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer with you. Just real quick, show of hands, real quick. Come on, be bold. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for being real this morning. Okay, now I want to pray a prayer over all of us this morning. Let's do some breaking this morning. In the matchless and wonderful name of Jesus Christ, Father, I speak over Cornerstone Church. 
And I declare the promises of Abraham upon a cornerstone church and upon everyone here. Lord, I pray that you'd make us a great nation, a great church, a great family. Lord, thank you that you will bless us and make our name great. And Lord, we shall be a blessing. And you will bless those who bless us, and you will curse those who curse us. And in us, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In Jesus' matchless, powerful name, I break the power of sin and death over this place right now. I declare success in Christ Jesus. I declare for grades to get better. I declare for incomes to go up. I declare for families to be healed. I declare for sickness to go away. I pray that this church would be a healthy church physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, relationally. And Lord, we declare that we would be a blessing that out of this church, the entire world will be blessed from across town to across the planet in Jesus' name. Because we are children of Abraham, heirs according to the promise, and we are sons of God through Jesus Christ. We are a royal priesthood in Jesus' name. I declare blessing right now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. let's all stand if we could. We're going to conclude with one song. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And as we do that, I'm going to ask the ushers, I'm not ushers, I'm saying the prayer team to make their way up. Father, I already blessed the food that we're going to eat in Jesus' name. It's blessed. Let us have a great time as we fellowship and celebrate in Jesus' name. God bless you.